and welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 60th episode, our guest is David Carson. David Carson is a Pulitzer Prize-winning photographer for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He began his career at 16 when his mother drove him to his first newspaper assignment because he wouldn't have his license for another two months. A Boston-area native, he has worked at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch since 2000. Before arriving in the Midwest, he worked at the Naples Daily News in Florida, at the Providence Journal Bulletin in Rhode Island, and as a freelance photographer in New England. Carson's images are featured extensively in the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Breaking News Photography that was awarded to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch photo staff. And if you haven't heard episode 38 of this podcast with David's colleague at the Post-Dispatch, Robert Cohen, I would recommend it. David has also won numerous other awards for his work over the years. In 2008, his multimedia project, Reporting for Duty, won a regional Emmy Award for Advanced Media, Interactivity. In 2009, he was part of a team that was recognized as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in the Breaking News Reporting category for their coverage of the Kirkwood City Hall shootings. He was also named the National Press Photographers Association Region 7 Photographer of the Year in 2011, 2010, and 2009. He attended college at the Rochester Institute of Technology, where he was a photojournalism major and international relations minor. And now, on to the show. Hi, my name is David Carson. I'm a staff photographer at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I've been here since uh, 2000. Okay, so how did you get your start in uh, photojournalism? What made you want to be a photographer in the first place? Oh, wow, that's that's a good question. I've, um, you know, I got my first camera ever, uh, a little uh, Kodak 110 um was given to me by the mother of the man who I was named after, my dad's best friend, uh, Dave Prentice, who was killed in Vietnam. And when I was like, I think nine or so, uh, she gave me my first camera. It was, in granted, it was just a little 110. But, um, you know, I, I, I must have been destined to be a photographer at that time because, yeah, I burned through that first roll of film in, in like two minutes. <laughs> and, um,. You know, I was young then. I hadn't, really, I didn't really, I hadn't really been thinking much about what I wanted to do. But a few years after that, I was, I think I was around 14, and I was at a um, a college, uh, spending the weekend with my grandparents at this college football game uh, at Penn State. And we actually went to the to a soccer game uh, at Penn State, and my uh, my dad had his 35 millimeter camera there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I asked my begged my dad to let me borrow his three five millimeter camera, and I went down on the field. And I made some pictures of the soccer game. This was this was in like October, November, or so. Mm-hmm. And after the game, I was like, "Hey, Dad, you know what I want for Christmas? I would like I'd like a camera for Christmas." And he goes, "You don't want to you don't want a thirty five millimeter camera. This is far too complicated for you. You're never going to use it." He goes, "What you want is a point and shoot." I was like, "No, no, no. I want one just like yours. You know, with all the buttons and." stuff and he goes all right but you're never going to use it and uh that was that was my first 30 millimeter camera i got one for christmas a pentax k1000 and i you know i still have that camera to this day you know it's tough as nails um camera and uh you know, the next year for Christmas, I asked for another camera, and I would just, I was one of those photography geeks at high school, you know, I was always around taking pictures and stuff, and I remember being at one of my friend's baseball games, and there was a photographer from the local paper across the field, and I was looking at him, and I'm like, wow, he gets paid to take pictures. <laughs> I should get paid to take pictures. <laughs> and uh, I went home to my parents that night and announced that. I remember being very nervous about it, but I was thinking, like, all right, I'm going to tell them I want to be a photographer. And, you know, I was in, like, 10th grade or something. And so I, I went down, I worked up the courage, and I told my parents, and uh, I was like, I want to be a photographer. And they're like, that's great, kid, whatever, bye. And I was like, ha oh, yes. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, it was from from that point on in tenth grade. I I was kind of always one of my goals was to be a newspaper photographer. Um, I got. Um you know, I used to go up and I would, any, anytime there was a photographer from the local paper around, I'd go up and I would talk to him and, 
Um, I'd be like, hey, you know, I was t- probably this really irritating kid, but I would always go up and ask all these questions of him and stuff. And uh, finally, one of them uh, said, yeah, well, you know, what's your phone number? Maybe we'll call you for an assignment sometime or something. And so I finally got I got this phone call from the from the guy at the Milford Daily News, uh, Michael Waltz, as I think his name was. And he goes, hey, we got this baseball game that needs to be covered. Do you want to do you want to shoot it? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to shoot. I got, I can do it. <laughs> what I didn't know at the well, but the problem was at the time was is that I didn't have my driver's license. I was, I was in sixteen. I was wasn't. I had to be sixteen and a half to drive, and I think I was still a few months off from being sixteen and a half. And so I um, had to ask my mother to drive me to my first newspaper assignment. <laughs> Um, so that's how I got started and was, you know, shooting freelance, uh, freelance stuff for the local papers. And, um, then I started doing some bunch of stuff for a local weekly in town called the country Gazette and working in their dark room. And just, I was just, I just always loved, you know, making pictures. And so anytime someone would pay me to take a picture, I would do it when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, I met, uh, I met uh, Stan Grossfeld uh, when I was in high school, and he was a um, staff photographer at the Boston Globe, and he was kicking butt and winning Pulitzer Prizes uh, back then with his work on Ethiopia. And I remember just being in awe of looking, you know, looking at his work. And um, I ran it. I ran into him. Um, when I was in high school, and I was like, "Where, like, where did you go to college?" And he said, "I went to the Rochester Institute of Technology." And I said, "That's where I want to go then." Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually applied to more schools than just uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology. I applied to Syracuse and some other stuff. But um, as soon as I got into RIT, I knew that that was going to be the school where I was going to go. Um, I never got into Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> that made it kind of easy, and um, I think RIT was probably the best best school for me to go to. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a long answer to what you uh, no, you that's, asked. No, that's fine, yeah. Um, now, you kind of mentioned uh, your first camera there. What is your uh, setup nowadays? Oh, I'm using uh, all Canon cameras. I use a Canon 1DX and a Canon uh, 5D Mark IV. Um, you know, they both have different functions. Um, I'd like to have two 1DXs, but, um, you know, with the budget constraints the way they are at, at the paper, you know, we've got, you know, one one really great camera and one pretty good camera. <laughs> um, but, you know, the the 5D has some has some really nice functionality that I like as well. It's got, you know, Wi-Fi connectivity. I can send things directly out of it mm. to the paper and stuff. Wow. Okay. Um, so is that your preferred setup for personal use, or do you just use that because that's what the paper has? You know, I've always liked Canons. I had Canons before I arrived at the, at the Post-Dispatch. Um, uh, I, I used Nikons for a while when I was down in Florida, but I'm really pretty agnostic on my equipment. You know, I, I don't think that the picture lies in the camera. The picture is in the photographer. And, mm-hmm. you know, I make nice pictures with my iPhone as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, like, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I like Canons, but, you know, it's not that I can't make nice pictures with other with other cameras. It's mm-hmm. just, you know, I I think uh, for me it's always less been less about equipment and more about personal uh, what you're bringing to the table personally. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I think there's a John Lennon quote that's like, uh, "If you give me a tuba, I'll do something with it or whatever." Um, so, right. right. Um, but uh, how would you describe the St. Louis area to someone who's never been there before? How, and how long have you been in St. Louis? So I arrived in St. Louis in 2000, so I've been here about 17 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, St. Louis is weird. Um, I, I kind of always I, I grew up in Boston and I kind of think of St. Louis as being the last of the the furthest west of the northeastern cities uh, because if you go to, if you go south of St. Louis it becomes very southern very quick if you go west of St. Louis it starts to take on much more of a um, uh, more of a like a midwestern sort of w- uh, western flavor there's more of a cowboy culture as the further west out of St. Louis you get um, so it's St. Louis and St. Louis is very much influenced from the north, from Chicago. And so you know, St. Louis has always really been this really weird mixing of 
uh, of, of cultures and stuff. Um, the, the city center feels very, very much like a northeastern city to me. Um, but, uh, you know, if you travel a couple hours to the south, you get these real thick southern draws going on. And uh, that uh, that always shocks me when I get down there for a story. I'm always like, oh, my, oh my God, I forgot how close I am to the south, actually. <laughs> Um, so that that's always sort of interesting to me. And um, St. Louis has an inferiority complex to Chicago. They they're very proud that their baseball team always beats, uh, you know, used to always beat the Cubs. Um, but um, they, you know, there was a time in the, there was a time in the in the country where I think St. Louis was the third biggest city in, in the United States. I mean, St. Louis is a city that peaked around uh, 1904. 1910 or so, uh, 1904, they held the first modern Olympics uh, of of the uh, mo- they, they held the first modern Olympics in 1904 with the St. Louis World's Fair. World's Fair. Um, <clears throat> you know, we had this great. You know, it was the city on the, on a rise. Everything was new, um, but then if you look, you know, because St. Louis was really the the furthest west of the major metropolitan areas, and it was right on the other side of the Mississippi River. And then as people continued to develop further west on the and on the west coast, and river traffic became less important, St. Louis began to decline. And so, what you have now is you have a city that uh, is very much in transition. It has about half the population that it used to have. And um, while there's, while I've seen improvements in the city since I arrived here in 2000, I think the city still has a long ways to go before it gets back to the the prominence it once had. Mm-hmm. The city is also um, fairly divided racially. Um, the city is about 50% black, 50% white, but almost no white people live north of a major road in town called Del Mar. Um, so, you know, the, the southern part of the city is more integrated, but, uh, you know, it is a city that does re- wrestle with uh, racial, r- racial issues. Definitely. Um, and now, of course, the way I became familiar with, with your work was because of the uh, Ferguson riots. Um, what was your memories of kind of the opening days? Um, you kind of described that situation of uh, extreme you know, segregation of, of black and white. And uh, was, was this a surprise to you personally that this happened? Did this catch you off guard? So, you know, I think it's important to go back and look in 2014. When, when I look back at it, when it happened, yes, it was a surprise. In retrospect, of course, of course, it was Ferguson. Uh, but when I say it was a surprise, I would I would have told you it would have been in, in one of the other municipalities where where this incident had occurred. Uh, but ten years before any of the Ferguson protests began, we worked on a major series in St. Louis called Law and Disorder, where we looked at the balkanization and fracturization of the uh, or fracturing. I don't think fracturization is a word. <laughs> That's a, okay. I, 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 I totally, if you hadn't said that, I would have totally believed it. It's fine. It's just how you sell it. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> right, right. But looking at the fracturing of the municipal structure of St. Louis County and, and, the, and the police department's in the area, we are a county of more, oh boy, I think, I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head right now, but we've got, I think, more than 90 municipalities in St. Louis County, and some of these municipalities are less than one square mile, and a lot of these municipalities came up during the uh, 50s and 60s as the city was as the city of St. Louis was experiencing white flight and people were fle- you know white people were fleeing out of the city as uh, out of the city's neighborhoods as they became more integrated and um, so they would set up these little municipalities of less than a square mile and then these little municipalities would have their own police department and these police departments would raise funds by traffic fines and so we were looking at, you know, this municipal structure. Ten years before Ferguson ever happened, we were looking at this municipal structure and this policing structure that existed in St. Louis County. And one of the things that was we were reporting on specifically was the uh, habit of bad police officers to hop from from department to uh, from the small department to the small department. We called it the muni sh- the muni shuffle. And whereas, like a police officer would run into some sort of problem in these small municipal departments, and then he would resign as opposed to being fired. 
fired, and because he would resign, there would be no permanent mark on his record, and he would just go off and he'd find a job at another small police department. And there were, there were some very real issues we uncovered in, during that investigation. Um, and then we compared that with Los Angeles County uh, out in L.A., where they have like one overriding police department that oversees all of L.A. and um, and how that provides better value for the um, better value for, for the taxpayers and provides a higher level of policing. Uh, because, you know, if you have these small police departments, they're not really well equipped to provide funding and training to their police officers. And, they you know, they're kind of glorified, you know, ticket writers. Um, whereas if you have a larger department, you can get, you have time for more training and more professionalization and, and other things. So we looked at that 10 years before Ferguson ever began. And um, before Ferguson began, I would have told you there's there were several municipalities in the middle of the county where there, where there were police departments that I it wouldn't have surprised me if this happened. But what was unique about Ferguson was Ferguson was a town of uh, that was a majority black population, and uh, I think it was sixty five percent black at the time in in, in uh, two thousand fourteen, and of um, uh, of even though it was a majority black population. The power structure in the town uh, was almost all white. Uh, there was only one black uh, city councilman at the time in 2014. In the police force of more than 30 people, there was only three black police officers. And so the, the, what you had is you had a majority black town being ruled over by this white power structure there in Ferguson. And so... In retrospect, of course it was Ferguson, right? You know, if you go back and you read the DOJ reports about the issues that um, that the city of Ferguson had with uh, who they were pulling over, they were pulling over mostly black drivers. And of the black drivers they pulled over, the black drivers were much more likely to spend time in jail and be arrested compared to the white drivers who were pulled over. And all this was uncovered in the DOJ investigation. But, you know... I wouldn't have told you before 2014 that Ferguson was going to be the town where where that was going to be known internationally. I, I, I literally just got done talking with a group of Danish students about... You know, Ferguson, these are people from Denmark, you know, these are high school, college kids from Denmark, and they know where Ferguson is. And I could have asked people in St. Louis before 2014, I could have asked about half the people in St. Louis who, like, point out Ferguson on a map to me, and I bet you most people would have failed at it. Uh, but now people in Denmark know the word Ferguson. Um, and so that's, you know, it's not. It's a town. It's 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 a. There are some very nice towns. There's a there's a wine bar in Ferguson. There's a brew pub in Ferguson. Um, it's a town, you know, which is, you know, like the city of St. Louis has declined from its peak of when it was a more affluent town at one time. But there's still a lot of very nice things in that town. But it's also a town that was struggling with its racial issues, and you know, there was a lot of. Um, a lot of poor um, people that, uh, living in Ferguson at the time, too, that were being, you know, sometimes exploited by the police there. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, um, in retrospect of, in, re in retrospect, of course, it was Ferguson. But at the time of it, that was not what I was expecting to happen. Um, I right. also say that in St. Louis, th that day, August 9th, there was a fatal police officer involved shooting. But fatal police officer involved shootings are not that uncommon an occurrence, sadly, in St. Louis. We have about 10 to 12 of them a year in the area. So when when I first heard about when I first heard about this shooting, I was doing back to school shopping with my wife and my daughter at, at a Target, and I got this. Um, tweet from this guy who had followed on Twitter for a few years, and he said, you know, how come this is something that needs to run in the Post-Dispatch? And it was a picture of Lewis Head, Michael Brown's stepfather, holding the sign that said, Ferguson Police just executed my son. And my initial reaction to it was, was like, oh, come on, man, this is my day off. Like, I wasn't like, oh my god, this is unbelievable. It, like, this was... You know, it sounds sad, but this was another police officer involved shooting. Um, I, you know, they just they happen 
you know, with some frequency in, in St. Louis. And so I was on my day off and I, I, you know, I kind of felt compelled to call into the city desk. I called into the city desk and I said, Hey, do we know about this? And they said, yes. Uh, Denise Hollenshed and, uh, one of our reporters in Huimok, one of our photographers are on their way out there. I said, great, you guys got it covered. Let me know if you need any help. And I kind of went back to shopping with my wife and my kid. But now I'm kind of like looking at Twitter and I can see like all this, all this stuff kind of snowballing on, on social media and all this stuff that's taking place. And, um, you know, I end up, I end up going up there that day. I'm, I'm talking to Hui, our photographer. I'm like, do you need help? And he goes, yeah, I could use, I could use some backup. And so I, I went up there to help out and, uh, I, I got up there just as they're like washing Michael Brown's blood off the street and, uh, their uh, people are yelling at the cops saying you're trying to cover it up and I was like well you know they're not tr- they're, they're you know it's a biohazard if there's a bunch of blood on the street and I've seen them wash down the scenes many times but that sort of speaks to the distrust the community had with the police that you know you know unfortunately I've been to a lot of homicide scenes I've seen what there's normal practices and so I would try to talk to people and be like no that they're not trying to cover it up they're just trying to wash the blood off the street so you know no one no one you know touches the blood or has to interact with the blood in any ways but but the community just didn't trust the police and the community you know, a lot of people in the community still don't trust the police mm-hmm. um, so I think some of the police are trying hard to you know change that image um, but I think there's still a long ways to go uh, with a lot of officers uh, mm-hmm. up here yeah, and uh, to kind of go back to your point about the um, fines and fees, you know, if if you want to, you know, before uh, Darren Wilson knew that Michael Brown was a suspect in this, uh, you know, the, whatever happened in the convenience store, you know, he was stopped for jaywalking. You know, that's, that's kind of the uh, initial reason that the interaction happened at all. So, you know, right there we have a small microcosm of what you're saying in these small municipalities, uh, you know, basically funding their budgets based off of these, you know, Nick one dime things so and he was less stopped too i mean the interaction if you read the doj report you know michael brown and dorian johnson are walking down the middle of the street and darren wilson is driving is driving down the lane and if you read dorian johnson's version of it uh dorian johnson says uh Officer Wilson approached him and said, you know, get the F out of the street. And, um, you know, Officer Wilson's version of the events is, you know, I asked the gentleman to step to the sidewalk. So there, immediately there, there's a disparity between, um, you know, n- narratives there originally. Now, part of the problem with Dorian Johnson is, is Dorian Johnson is the only one who's a, a total eyewitness to all these events. Mm-hmm. Dorian Johnson is literally a convicted perjurer. He was convicted of perjury. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, but if you ask me, you know, in my experience of having been in North County and around North County police officers and done ride-alongs with North County police officers for, for you know, for years before that point, get the F out of the street sounds to me like the way a police officer would talk to someone in, in that community. That doesn't sound unbelievable to me. Mm-hmm. Um Darren Wilson, you know's testimony of can you can you gentlemen please step to the sidewalk does not I don't that just somehow rings hollow. <laughs> um, Excuse me, good sirs. <laughs> right. So it, it, you know that. So you know, unfortunately, you know what would have solved a lot of this is is uh, body cameras, and you know, the Ferguson Police Department did not have body cameras at that time. Um, I always, I always say that I think body cameras should be a you know I realize that that footage can be misinterpreted and stuff, but um, a body camera is, is going to be is going to record events pretty neutrally, and it's going it, to it would have recorded what their initial interaction was there, mm-hmm. um, and it would have clarified a lot of this narrative. Um, and you know, and when we're talking about narrative, part of the reason why Ferguson happened. Is the before Ferguson happened, the police when when, when there was a police officer, a fatal police officer involved shooting, police handled it. Their 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 method of handling it was is to really not provide, not release much information at all, and say it's an ongoing investigation, and just not say anything. And what the police did not see that was taking place was there was an entire narrative developing 
on social media and that was spreading through the community. The community was getting their news through social media about what the events were that happened there. And the police were not really countering it with any significant information um, on social media. And so there was this whole narrative on social media that Officer Darren Wilson had executed Mike Brown while Mike Brown was kneeling. And, you know, if you go back and you read the DOJ report, it, that that's, that's probably not an accurate n- narrative. Mm-hmm. But that was the narrative that people out on the streets were reading and believing. Um, right. Well, I've, I've long thought that the main problem with the entire situation was the the way in which it looked to people or the way that, that met the, what happened was interpreted by people. And I don't think the, the people that were in charge there did themselves any favors uh, again and again, you know, and then this could have been totally legitimate and a competent handling of this, like a deft touch as far as like what the community is thinking and feeling would have been, you know, I think it would have gone down differently. Yeah. You know, it's so, you know, Ferguson was an event that, you know, it was the, it's literally the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm-hmm. And now everyone around the world knows Ferguson. Um, it is, you know, when, when you look back on it, that particular police officer involved shooting was not different than a lot of the other ones that I covered. And I remember talking to my boss a few times within the first couple of days and thinking and say, me, me saying to him, like, OK, I, I've seen this before. This isn't going to last much longer. This this is about it. This you know, there's no way the police are going to let this continue. And um, it did. It just it just continued to sort of mm-hmm. evolve and grow. And 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 every time the police would try, you know, the way the information would come out, the 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 police the community would react would react really horribly to the way the police were, you know released the information. Um, that, you know, because because it ran when the police finally came forward with a lot of information, it, it was so counter to what the narrative was that it has been established on social media mm-hmm. that it looked like the police were trying to cover something up, mm-hmm. and so that really enraged people. Um, and so, you know, I I think when you when you look back at it, there was. You know, you saw police starting to try to change their habit and release more information uh, quicker and more early and stuff. And I think that why police are always hesitant to release too much information too soon is that it's like a game of telephone. And, you know, the people that are charged with talking or, you know, the chiefs and the captains Mm -hmm. and stuff are not directly involved in are not directly involved in the investigations and so they they're relying on information from somebody else and just like a game of telephone when you mm-hmm. pass information to someone else it, it changes and we had a shooting in St. Louis um, uh, Von Derrick Myers was shot uh, on October 9th or 10th or so like that and that was a situation where the where the St. Louis police chief came out and tried to be proactive and said yes he was shot and he pointed uh, but this uh, this 18-year-old uh, pointed this make and model of, of gun at the police officers. Well, he got the make and model of the gun wrong, and and so people were like, "Oh, it's a cover-up," and you know that's not that's not what they gathered at the scene. It was planted, and so even though they were trying to be proactive, you know they they got they got a detail wrong, and then everyone was crucifying them for it. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that that's why a lot of times police are hesitant to release information too soon, mm-hmm. but. At the same time, I think that you've seen a change. Um, the St. Louis County Police hired someone to do social media mm. for them, and you know, to sort of keep up with it and put out, you know, keep up with their narrative events there and stuff. So, well, yeah, no, a lot. Of, I've seen this with smaller uh, police departments that I've covered at different newspapers, but you know, a lot of times when they they are careful to release information, and, and of course, you you did a good job of explaining why that might be. Uh, at the same time, in the space between when it happens and when they finally do speak up, uh, you know, that kind of grows out in the community and, and things that might not be taken seriously otherwise gain traction that, you know, the, the space between, you know, while they deliberate what to say exactly kind of, you know, that, that foments, you know, all around. And, you know, a lot of times they lose control of the narrative because they didn't speak up because there wasn't anything to fill that vacuum. So a lot of times hearsay will do in that, in that case. So, um, now, uh, one of 
of your most iconic photos and the one that that always sticks in my mind is the uh, one inside the convenience store when it's being looted um man uh, i just first of all i can't believe how brave you were going into there uh, can you talk a little bit about how that came about and and was your wife and family members uh, happy with you that you decided to take such a choice there <laughs> yeah i think brave is a generous word <laughs> Stupid would be another word, uh, less than optimal personal safety. Um, so that was the second night of. That was really the first. That was really the first night of protest. It was the day after Michael Brown had been had been shot, and um, I was not working that day. And uh, at the end of my first night out there in Ferguson, I um, people were saying that there was going to be this candlelight vigil the next night, and so I called my boss and said, "Hey, it sounds like." there's going to be this candlelight vigil out here tomorrow night. I'm not working. Do you think we can adjust one of our other photographers scheduled to be out? He's like, yeah, yeah, we can make that happen. And so one of our other staff photographers, JB Forbes was out there at that. And he photographed, um, the shooting, he photographed uh, the candlelight vigil down there at, at where Michael Brown had been shot, and people brought flowers and and candles down there, and right at dusk, and as as that began to break up there, the police uh, police there was a heavy police presence around, and and then the police um, the the armored vehicle showed up, and things you know people began to square off with the police and then people began throwing things at the police, you know, bottles of water, uh, beer bottles, rocks, any, anything that could be thrown. And so, you know, the things just kind of started to escalate and I was seeing, uh, on, so I was watching this, I'm sitting at home on my couch and I'm watching this unfold and, um, I'm seeing reporters tweet about they're being threatened to leave. Um, seeing that, um, that you know we're um one of the one of the um TV live trucks was, uh, you know, forced to leave the area and stuff. And so I called JB and asked him how it's going. He goes, well, you know, it's real tense. You know, I could use, I could probably use some help because uh, JB was being forced to leave the area. And so um, right before I came into work, I, uh, I was seeing these, these tweets go back and forth. And I, one of the reporters at the local public radio station, uh, Rachel Lippman, was tweeting out that, uh, that there were rocks and bottles being thrown and uh, at police and I, I mentioned I, I tweeted out actually that it looked like you know Ferguson was a powder keg and it was going to take restraint on both sides both the police officers and the protesters side to keep it from deteriorating any further and, um, and then it just it just it went south and so I jumped in my I went upstairs to my wife and I said listen I gotta go into work again um, I'll see you Bit, I'll see you a little bit later. And uh, between, it's about 10 miles from my house up to Ferguson, and, and the newspaper is in between both Ferguson and, and the paper. And so I stopped by. I stopped by the the newspaper to grab some long lenses, a 400 millimeter, a couple 400 millimeters, and a 500 millimeter, because I was going to bring some equipment up for some other photographers as well. And then we have this closet, which we usually would, where we kept bulletproof vests and and helmets, ballistic helmets and gas masks, and we always called it the war closet because the only time you went into this closet was when you were going to go to Iraq or Afghanistan, and that's why we had that equipment around was from when we had embeds in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm. And from being out there the night before, I was like, you know, I'm just in case I'm going to bring along some some vests and stuff. And I don't know why I did that, but I just had this feeling I was going to need it. And so, as I'm, um, I, I throw all this gear in the back of my car. It's a crappy 2006 Nissan Sentra with a hundred thousand miles on it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I'm carrying fifty thousand dollars worth of gear inside this, you know, five thousand dollars car. <laughs> and we're driving on on the on the highway going up to Ferguson, and like all these cop cars are flying by me at more than a hundred miles an hour because the uh, code one thousand has been called out, mm. and so that means that they're they're just calling for aid from any available officers. And uh, 
as I get up there, you know, the traffic's real bad and all these roads are closed down. And one of our social media people you know, texts me and says, um, oh, it looks like the Quick Trip is the center of the protest. You should try to get there. And I'm like, oh, that's that's a fine idea. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I was like, I, I see where it is on the map. And I'm like, I'm trying to get there. And I can't, like, I can't get close to it because all these roads are, are blocked and everything. And Ferguson already has a lot of blocked off dead-ended one-way roads. And so it was just, it was really hard to navigate there. And so about 25 minutes after I had that conversation that Ferguson, that the Quick Trip was where I should try to be, uh, I finally got to be within three blocks of it. And I was like, you know what? This is good enough. I'm going to get out of my car. And so I just parked my car. And I go back to my trunk, and I, I put on a ballistic helmet and a bulletproof vest, and I strap a gas mask to my leg, and I throw my computer bag over my shoulder, and I put my two cameras on, and I start walking down the three blocks towards towards the quick trip. And I, like, I like walk one block, and I'm like, wow. Oh. I look like an asshole. Where, where do I think? Where do I think I am? Like, I don't need all this stuff. And so, like, I, you know, I, I take off the helmet. I strap the helmet to my leg, and I walk up another block. And there's some gunshots. I hear some gunshots in the distance, and I can kind of see all these all this craziness taking place up by the quick trip. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm going to put the helmet back on. I put the helmet back on, and I, I, I walked up towards the quick trip there. And I walked. Um, I, I never went on to the quick trip lot when I. First first got there, I kind of walked out and around it to the front of the quick trip, and I made a few pictures with a long 200 millimeter lens, and um, um, and I was standing outside the quick trip, and I and I actually sent this tweet, I'm outside the quick trip, and if, if you were standing next to me, you would have thought I was a crazy person, because I was, I was talking to myself, I'm like, alright, David, you're not close enough, you need to get closer, you need to, you need to go across the street. And so I, I'm like, I was psyching myself up to go and do this. And so I'm like, all right, let's go. And so I, I walked across the street and, uh, there was this guy out there and he's like filming the riot, the looting of the quick trip there. And I'm, I'm talking to him. I'm like, Hey, how's it going? He goes, Oh, I'm like crazy night. Huh? He goes, yeah. Huh? And we're just having this sort of polite conversation about how crazy it is, what's going on. And people are looting the quick trip and coming out with bottles of wine and stuff. And, um, I stick my camera in the quick trip and I shoot a couple pictures and I look at it and, and it doesn't look too crazy in there. You know, there's, there's really, there's no one in these pictures at all. And, uh, so I said to him, I said, Hey, the next time someone goes in this quick trip, I'm going to, I'm going to follow them in and make some pictures. And, he, and I go, can you watch my back? He goes, yeah, sure. That's fine. <laughs> and so this, this guy goes in the quick trip and I follow him in the quick trip and I make some pictures of him and he's got a Trayvon Martin shirt on and he comes through and he's got, um, a couple, um, like a six pack of beer and some snacks and stuff. And I make some pictures of him. And then this 16 year old kid goes around the corner and he, he grabs, he's grabbing a bunch of Pepsi, uh, out of this cooler. Cause it, like when you're 16, you, you loot Pepsi. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. That or, that or all the other good stuff was already taken. But right. He was, he was like 16 and he's like stealing Pepsi. And, um, as I'm making that picture, this, this dude comes up behind me, he's a big dude. And he goes, Hey, what are you doing? And he lifts up his white shirt and he shows me the gun that's tucked in his waistband. And I'm like, um, I, I'm making pictures for the post dispatch. And he kind of looks at me and he leans in a little bit. And I say, your, your face is covered. No one will know who you are. You'll be fine. And he goes, okay. And he turns, he turns for me and goes back to leaving the store. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> And, and and that's when I decided to make his picture because now we've got this connection, right? Uh -huh. And so he's behind the he's behind the counter there, and I I shoot this picture of him, and you see the look he's giving me there, and I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, and I run out of the quick trip. I was outside the quick trip for about two minutes and ten seconds, and I know this from the timestamps on my camera, and I was inside the quick trip for less than two minutes, and I know oh, wow. from the timestamps on my camera as well. So I got in there and out of there. It wasn't, it wasn't like I hung out in there and <laughs> for 20 minutes. Like I got in, I got threatened with a gun, and I got the hell out. <laughs> And, yeah. um, you know, to give you an idea of how jacked up I was on adrenaline and, and nervous I was when I was in there, you know, it's a fairly simple operation to shoot an iPhone video. You know, my, my, my kid can shoot iPhone video in her sleep, right? 
So I thought that I I thought that I was shooting some great uh, iPhone video when I was in there as well. And as it turns out, like I I. I I thought I was hitting the iPhone to stop the video, and I clearly started the video at that point because you can see me. It goes dink, and then you can see me put the phone in my pocket, and I've got thirty <laughs> seconds of iPhone video in my pocket. So brilliant, right? Brilliant. Um, True multimedia journalist, all right, the way. <laughs> right. No, well, no, I was able to rescue the audio out of it, and the oh. audio worked out pretty good. Oh, so, okay. Well, um, hey. <laughs> um, so I was able to wrap that into a slideshow, but I uh. ran. After I got out of the quick trip there, I like I like run across the street and I like take shelter behind this fence and I can kind of see behind this fence and I pull out my computer and I'm so dragged jacked up on a, adrenaline and, and hot and sweating and stuff like that and I, and I can't actually type um, and so I but I know we're coming right up on deadline and so I I select like ten pictures from inside the quick trip and I and I just hit upload and, and they start moving back to my moving back to the paper and my boss Lyndon Steele is here at the paper and our managing assistant managing editor comes over Adam, Adam Goodman and says to my boss hey tell everyone out there not to take any stupid risks and just as he's saying this to him the picture of the guy with the gun <laughs> coming up on the screen and my boss turns the screen towards him and says too late and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I go and I stand. I, I get those pictures moved, and I go. And there's now there's like a line of cops like formed up the street. And like it was like 150, 200 cops are up the street, and I don't I don't want to stand too close to them, but I want to be. I'm standing kind of in, in between the cops and these protesters where the quick trip is there. And I do this video interview with this uh, preacher, and he's explaining to me why this is happening and 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 you know the, some of the historical context to it. And we have this great conversation, and he's directing traffic. And some this woman comes running down the street. The quick trip's on fire. The quick trip's on fire. And I'm like, oh, I should go make a picture of that. But I've learned my lesson about going inside a quick trip. <laughs> and so I I stand out by the sign where they where they advertise the price for gas there and stuff. And I make these pictures of these two groups of people that have formed out there. And one of them, one of the guys in the group says, hey, he's making our picture. Get him. Kick his ass. I was like, oh, no. And I turned and I just started running back towards... Um, towards that line of police and if anyone's seen me I'm you know I'm not really the most svelte of of guys there and stuff and um, I don't really run fast as it is and I run even less fast when I've got cameras and body armor and a, and a helmet on and stuff so I got to be within about 100 yards of that line of cops and this guy just caught up to me and he hit me right in the head and remember I felt like a jerk because I had that helmet on like I was really glad I had that helmet on um, so he hits me in the head and but that knocks me off balance and literally like it was you know in a movie when things happen in slow motion I remember this in like slow motion like falling to the ground and I see my camera like hit the ground and the lens shatters on the ground and goes skittering off towards the, the sidewalk and I, I, I roll a few times and, and this guy comes over that hit me in the head and starts you know kicking at me and I block like one of the kicks with my uh, butt and I, I'm kicking back at him as I lay on the back like on my back is like a turtle and I'm swinging this broken camera at him and stuff and that preacher um, who I talked to comes running down the street and says leave him alone leave him alone leave him alone and I get, and they backed off just a little bit and I was able to get to my feet and go and stand much closer to the line of cops then um, and they're like are you okay and I'm like yeah I'm, I'm fine I'm, I'm good you know and big my big bruises on my elbow and on my leg and stuff but you know it could have been much worse uh, so then we walked back down towards the quick trip and the quick trip at this time is fully almost you know becoming fully involved in flames and there's more gunfire going on and there's tear gas in the air and you know most of the cops didn't have a gas mask and I had a gas mask and I had my gas mask on and I don't know what they what they thought of me but at some point there they're like who are you and I'm like I work for the post dispatch and they, they kicked me out of the scene <laughs> so I, um, I got taken I was walked back out of the scene and I got put in a police car and I'm texting my boss and I'm like I, I can't I might be under arrest I can't tell 
They say they say we're going to the Jennings police station. I said if I don't email, if I don't text you in five minutes, come get me. And uh, we pulled up to the Jennings police station. We started to pull around back to the Sally Port. I'm like, oh, I'm totally arrested. And he stopped short of the Sally Port and he says, all right, get out, don't come back. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm without my car. My car is now back down by the Quick Trip, which is fully involved. And there's there's still about thirty five thousand dollars worth of gear in that car. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if they're going to burn the company car <laughs> because the company car has two antennas on it. It doesn't look unlike a police car and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so I tell my boss, I'm like, oh, good news is I'm not arrested. I said the bad news is that the company car is right down by the Quick Trip that they burned. <laughs> and um, I. He goes, well, that's no big deal. It's a crappy car anyways. I said, well, yeah, but it's got all our long glass in it. He goes, oh, no, yeah, that would be horrible. <laughs> um, it would be fine if they burned the company car and put our equipment outside of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that was that was the whole story behind that night there in the quick trip. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like you kind of knew that you had some pretty iconic photos uh, right away. I mean, you, you just pretty much sent them as, as you got them in. Um, what was the reaction to uh, to the photos after? Because I remember, were you on that uh, one thing with the um, uh, po- local police where they went with the SWAT team, and uh, there there was the the one picture of the, the guy just firing into the air? The yeah, um, yeah that, that's a was that was that yours? Okay, yeah, yeah, that was amazing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So one of the things I'm proud about of my coverage of Ferguson was is that I spent nights standing side by side with the protesters as they were being tear gassed and that rubber bullet shot at them and, you know, covering things from the protesters' perspective. And I also spent nights standing next to the police officers uh, embedded with the tactical team as they had rocks and bottles and and gunshots fired at them and stuff. And part of the reason why I got to do that was is I had these relationships because I was a local journalist and um, I'd been covering the police department and their issues for uh, for years. And um, I had these relationships in the police department. Department. And about a week into Ferguson, I was talking with my editor, Lyndon Steele, and I said, I said, well, you know, what aren't we covering? And we're having this discussion. And I said, I said, well, you know what we haven't seen is we haven't seen what the police officers are experiencing. He goes, yeah. And I said, you know, I could ask the public information officer if I could embed with the tactical team. I said, there's no way they're going to let us do it, but we should at least ask, right? And he goes, yeah, okay. And so I called the public information officer for the St. Louis County Police Department, and I said, hey, um, this is David from the Post Dispatch, and I said, uh, "Listen, I got a question for you. Can I can I embed with the tactical team?" And he goes, "Oh yeah, that'd be great. I think we can make that happen." I was like, "Wow! All right, great." <laughs> so, um, a few nights later, I'm there and I'm embedded with the tactical team, and you know these are the same guys that have been tear gassing me and shooting rubber bullets at me the, a few days before and were pointing weapons at me and threatening me with arrest, and now I'm hanging out with them and. You know, they're nice guys. You know, they were, they were nice guys and welcoming. They were glad I was there to show things from their perspective. Um, mm-hmm. And so we were we were in, embedded. I was embedded with them there that night, and I was making pictures. And uh, they, you know, we finally, we, they, they got sent out um, around 8 o'clock at night or so like that. And they, they began uh, forming up with a line of people with the, with, uh, with the tactical vehicles and then they went further down the street and they were confronting some people down by the quick trip and they were telling people to disperse and go home and there were some rocks that were being thrown and stuff and and then what actually ended up happening was is there were three gunshots that were fired uh, towards the police and that's when that's when all that that's when that tear gas picture was made is they are firing uh, tear gas in retaliation to, to gunshots at that point. Mm. So um, I remember when I made that picture, uh, I sent it back to my boss and uh, it ended up running on the front page mm. and I was sitting in the back of the, of the armored vehicle with, with, with the tactical team members and I'm looking and my boss has sent me a PDF of the front page. It's now like one thirty in the morning or so. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, oh, I don't know if these guys are going to like this picture or not. <laughs> 
And so I turned and I, I, I said, I turned to the guy, I knew who the guy was that was in the picture. I said, do you want to see yourself? And he goes, and I go, you're going to be on the front page tomorrow. And he goes, yeah. And I showed him the picture. And they were like, that's awesome. Like, they loved that. <laughs> and, and for me, what is interesting about that picture is, is that the cop, most of the cops I talked to really love that picture. They feel like that picture shows them responding with less than lethal force to, you know, gun gunfire. And th- th- they like this picture of this, the, the way they're portrayed there. And the protesters like this picture because they think that this shows the militarization of police. And so I think the way you view that picture depends on what your view of policing is in America. Mm-hmm. And stuff, and so it's one of those interesting pictures where people you know, view it from their own perspective and read a lot into it. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Now, um, you mentioned this a little bit uh, talking about your interactions with police, but you're familiar to local police because you're already a, a local journalist. And now I know a lot of journalists uh, that maybe weren't from there, or and some that were, uh, definitely had a different experience with the police. Uh, what was your personal uh, experience overall uh, with dealing with law enforcement throughout? You know, you know, I was threatened with arrest many times and stuff. Um, you know, I was told that you know, they were going to arrest me, and you know, I, I never, I was never arrested, um, but I was tear gassed on multiple times. I there, I heard rubber bullets whiz by me and stuff. Um, I got pepper sprayed on a separate occasion. Um, you know, that night I was embedded with the with the tactical team, we actually, the tactical team I was with actually arrested two journalists. And I, I found myself in this real ethical quandary. Like, I didn't feel like I was, ethically, I didn't feel like as a journalist I could interfere with them arresting these journalists. But as a journalist, it really upset me to watch them arresting these journalists. And so I did what I could do as a journalist, and I documented them arresting these guys. It was a guy from a German newspaper and a guy from the uh, this online, online publication, The Intercept. And, um, you know, I'm thinking to myself, don't arrest journalists. This is not worth it. But I'm not saying this to these guys. And uh, what I did do, though, is I I got the names and I got the names of the editors for both these journalists who had been arrested because they got thrown and they got put into the back of the armored vehicle where I was there and, and stuff, you know, with the rest of the tech team members. I said, listen, I said, what are your editors' names and numbers? I'm going to let them know you've been arrested. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, they... They they were arrested. Now, when we got back to the command center, I I the person who I felt like I could I could air this grievance with was the public information officer. Where I was like, I'm like, you know, dude, listen, like you can't don't arrest journalists. This isn't worth it. You know, you don't. I was trying to I was trying to represent these guys. You know, and I felt like I could have this conversation with the public information officer. It's his job to field to field this and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But you know, they insisted that these guys had, you know, done something, um, to which I never saw. I I didn't have a police radio on, so I couldn't hear what their conversations were. Um, but I was just like, yeah, it's not going to be worth it. The police in, in, in retrospect, the police ended up settling, giving monetary settlements to both these guys, um, for their arrest. So, you know, I don't, I think journalists should be allowed to do their job uh, and stuff. But where it would get interesting in Ferguson was is that everyone would say they were a journalist, right? <laughs> yeah, that was a new thing that happened, right? I mean, right. that was... Right. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, oh, I'm a journalist, right? And they'd have a camera out there and they'd be yelling, you know, they'd be cursing out the police officer at one time and then getting right in his face with the camera at another time. Like, you know, um, as a professional photojournalist, what I, you know, I tried not to interfere with the police as they were doing their job. I would try to give them their space to work and I would document it, but I wanted to be around to document it. And a lot of times they didn't want anyone around to document what they were doing. Mm-hmm. So, um, it was this weird thing where everyone's like, well, I'm a journalist. I got a camera. And, you know, you would see some things that you would see these people do things that were saying they were journalists that I would never do as a journalist. But, and so it made things confusing for the police. Um, they, you know, they used to like, oh, you're the police hear them say, I'm a journalist and he's got a camera that looks like my camera. And how's, you know, how's the cops supposed to distinguish that? I mean, the number of cops that I knew out there, like that I had a personal relationship with was probably, you know, there were maybe three or four cops out there that I knew by first name and stuff and, and who knew me. Um, but, you know, I definitely, you know, as Ferguson went on, I definitely knew more, more of the protesters by first name and they know, they knew me, but 
you know, I think I, I think my not getting arrested had a lot to do with just years of, you know, working out there and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, I interviewed your colleague, uh, Robert Cohen, on a previous podcast, and we uh, discussed, uh, of course, his iconic photo of uh, Edward Crawford. Uh, there's been a little bit of sad news uh, since then. Uh, what can you say about uh, kind of what's happened here? Yeah, so Ed, um, according to police, Ed, Edward Crawford uh, shot himself in a car last week, um, and he died. His funeral was just yesterday. Robert attended the funeral. Um that there are people to give you an idea of how what the state of police uh the the relationship police have with some people in the area still is um some people believe that the police killed killed edward um I don't know what to think about it, but they feel like something's being covered up. There was another protester covered, uh, killed last year, Darren Seals. He was uh, shot in the head, and then his Jeep was driven to another location, and his Jeep was set on fire. Police feel, uh, some protesters feel like Darren will, uh, Darren Seals was uh, also killed by police. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. I've seen some people float. You know, I, he, you know, if you talked, if you talked, uh, we, we talked with Edward uh, Edward Crawford's uh, parents. He's the guy throwing back the tear gas, and they they don't think he killed himself. They think that seems very out of line there and stuff. And um, um, so it's they they don't think that that's that that's what happened, but. Mm. The police, what the police are reporting is, is that Edward was in this car uh, with these two women, and Edward shot himself in the head and you know killed himself. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have homicide detectives investigating it; they have district cops investigating it. I, 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 I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to say, but we do know that Edward has sadly died, mm-hmm. and his funeral was yesterday. Right, right. Now, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, your last answer, that it seems like maybe not a lot has changed as far as the community's relationship with, with the police, or, or do you think it has changed at all? I think in some ways it has changed. Um, I mean, there's there's still some people that don't trust the police at all. Um, you know, it's it's hard to, it's hard to say. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Um, you know, it, 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 it's. It, I think. I think you see some police officers making an effort to be more accessible. Um, you know, it's just hard to. Um, you know, it, 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 there's 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 probably some people in the community the police are never going to reach. You know, they've had they've been so soured on relationships with police mm-hmm. over the years that they're you know nothing the police are going to do is going to be able to change that. Right. Um, well, unless but, the the financial incentive for you know interactions with police is is changed, kind of alluding back to the DOJ report, you know that you know the, the interactions with police will will inherently be different if that's the structure behind it. You know, if it's a fees gathering thing so if that's not a thing anymore that might change but if it's still a thing that's like you know what i mean yeah you know i mean th- th- there's been laws passed in missouri about the percentages of of your uh, town of your town's revenue that can come from traffic fines and stuff so that has changed you're seeing more departments with body cameras um uh, that have happened. Um, there's been some consolidations. Um, uh, there's been some consolidations of police departments of the smaller police departments consolidating into a bigger police department here and stuff. Um, so uh, it's 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 just a series of. Um, uh, of choices that you know that are being being made to you know where people are trying you know there's dialogues taking place and there's been the Ferguson Commission report and so but you know this is going to be a long process um so yeah wow. um so you uh, won the Pulitzer along with your colleagues there for for your work um how did that feel and and was there kind of a, a kind of a dual feeling of also, you know, this was a really sad uh, experience for the community, but it's it's great, you know, because when I go to journalism award shows, it's always like, this is the one and only time uh, that somebody's going to clap for the word homicide, you know, like, like in, a, in a headline, you know, this is like, the, this is it, but yeah. So that that was, uh, that, that day back in May of 15 uh, up in the newsroom was a really cool day. Um, um, you know, we were all the, the the whole newsroom was gathered around a TV, and we didn't. 
we didn't really know like what our chances were. Like we thought that we that you know we were going to be in the running, but we didn't know. And the photography awards, one of the last awards that's announced, and they they worked their way down through a number of awards. And we thought maybe we stood a chance in general news reporting for the whole newsroom, and maybe editorial writing in both of those categories passed without them ever mentioning um, without them ever mentioning. Uh, the post dispatch in there, so I was like, I was like, oh no, maybe, maybe we blew this here. And uh, then when they got down to the to the uh, breaking news award, and they, they they announced the post dispatch, that was you know the room kind of erupted in in cheers, and you know I I was pretty conscious not to raise my hands or cheer because. I mean, it, it was a relief, and there's this amazing honor, which I will remember for the rest of my life. But you know, this all these all these events started with the death of an 18 year old kid, and that is always something which tempers your your sort of pleasure for it. You know, um, but you know, it is an uh, you know it is an amazing honor, and it's it definitely going to be a career highlight uh, for me and a lot a lot of the photographers here at the paper. Um, but it's you know, it it is weird that one of my career highlights, you know, comes out of the death of of, of an eighteen year old, and I've, you know, I, um, that's something I'm always, I'll always be aware of, and you know, mm-hmm. so yeah, definitely. Um, so, it, kind of speaking of difficult subject matter, kind of great, making uh, a great work. Uh, your your recent uh, photo essay, I guess, of the uh, the couple there that that were willing to be recorded uh, shooting heroin. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that experience? Sure, that was some of the more crazy nights I've had since Ferguson. Um, we'd been out. Uh, Jesse Bogan and I uh, had been out working on uh, a heroin story. We'd been tracking a heroin story for more than a month or so, and what we found out in our investigations uh, were is that the heroin, the the rate of uh, we had we had more than 270 heroin overdoses in 2016 in St. Louis, compared to 100 uh, 177 homicides, and we were shocked to find out that. Our, our rate of homis, our rate of uh, heroin overdose has exceeded our our homicide rate because I had been to you know dozens of homicides over the year, but I don't think I covered any any uh, overdoses. And so this was a subject we felt we had underreported, and so we went back to sort of look at that and look at what some of the issues were. And so we were kind of working. Um, or with some people like you know, who were who were drug users and working to help drug users get get off of heroin and stuff, and we had actually gone to this house of this other heroin addict, uh, Katie, uh, who we were expecting to. Uh, who we were trying to hook up with it. We just didn't have any luck because she's a heroin user. She'd given us her phone number, then her phone would get turned off, and then she'd tell us she'd meet us someplace, and she wouldn't meet us someplace. And so we were just were going to go over her house and try to meet her. And that's when we went to Katie's house. Of course, Katie wasn't there, but this guy Richard was there. Mm-hmm. And Richard was very clearly high uh, when we were talking to him. And he goes, no, Katie's not here. And he goes, are you with the Post-Dispatch? And he's like, yeah. And he goes, you should do a story on me. And we're like, really? And we're like, why should we do a story on you? And he and he starts he starts talking, and I'm like, all right, maybe we should do a story here on you. <laughs> and he starts telling us about how heroin you know, has, has ruined his life and has stolen his soul and um, you know, he says all these things that are very poetic and stuff. And uh, I start shooting some video of it, and I start making these pictures. And then this woman comes down the street, and she goes, "Richard, what the hell are you doing?" Right? And I was like, "Oh, Richard's gonna stop talking to us," because in my mind, what she was doing, she was mad that he was talking to us. In in retrospect. She was mad that he wasn't coming down to give her the drugs that she wanted. Um, and so uh, I go over, and Jesse continues to try to talk to Richard a little bit, and I, I go over to sort of try to talk with her. And she's smoking, and she, I look at her, and, like, she looks pregnant. And I'm like, and then she says that she is pregnant, but that she's on methadone. And I'm like, oh, okay. But, you know, she's, like, six months pregnant at this point, and she's, like, smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, well, that's not really a great choice. I'm thinking to myself, that's not really a great choice, but, you know, I'm not going to say anything. I mean, she's she's kind of hard to read, right? And I think she's mad at us. And I don't want her to 
interfere with you know the process you know, with you know the success we've had with Richard talking to us there and stuff and mm-hmm. um, so I go back over and I was talking with Richard and I'm like you know I'm like are you high now he goes yeah I'm high now and I'm like uh, I'm like when do you think you're going to use again he goes as soon as I'm done talking to you guys and mm. I'm like well can I can I hang out with you while you do it and he's like sure no problem at all and so they they um. Jesse, uh, the reporter, actually has to go and pick his kid up at at daycare. Mm -hmm. And I was riding with Jesse, so we didn't look like weird, like riding through these neighborhoods as like a like a because I I don't look unlike a cop, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so Jesse leaves to pick up his kid, and I'm like, I'm staying here with Richard, and uh, so now I'm walking down the street to this house I don't know with these two heroin addicts, and I'm texting my boss. Um, I'm going to be inside this house with these people shooting heroin. This is the address I'm out. Um, if you don't hear from me in an hour, come get me. <laughs> so, and so we go inside the house and they, they put down their stuff and, um, you know, 90 minutes after I meet them, they're shooting heroin in front of me. And I was so focused on Richard, you know, doing this heroin that I didn't really notice that Ashley was, was also tying off. And, and I, I'd put Ashley in my mind, I'd put Ashley in this non-user camp and, um, Mm -hmm. I saw Ashley tying off and I'm like, are you, are you going to shoot methadone? Which is a stupid question. I know that methadone is taking orally, Mm -hmm. but it didn't make sense to me why Ashley was tying off. And she goes, no, I, I missed my dose of, of I missed my dose of methadone, so I'm just going to bump here so I don't feel sick. And so I'm watching Richard look for a vein in his arm as Ashley, the woman who's six months pregnant, sticks a plunger full of of heroin into her vein and, and, and injects heroin there. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe what I'm, what I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd never seen anybody use heroin before. And now I'm watching a woman who's six months pregnant use and this other guy use. Um, mm-hmm. And because Ashley was on methadone, methadone serves as a blocking agent to, to heroin. So she wasn't getting real high off of it, but Richard, uh, Richard was very high, uh, off of it. Um, mm-hmm. so I continued to photograph them there for a few weeks. We had some concerns about whether we had to report Ashley's drug use or not. Like if we had any mandatory reporting requirements as, mm-hmm. as a journalist, when we witnessed the when we witnessed this pregnant lady shooting it and we didn't have reporting requirements, but we didn't think we knew we were going to run this story quickly. And so when you talk about you know, mandatory reporting. I'm like, well, we're going to publish this in a paper. We're going to publish this 200,000 times on a Sunday paper. So mm-hmm. that's doing a, you know, while my job as a journalist is not to tattle, you know, we're not tattletales. I am going to photograph you using drugs and I'm going to publish it. And they knew that that's what I was going to do. I told them I was going to publish it. Um, a few thing, a few conversations we had with them, as I said, you know, before we ever walked down to their house, I said, you know, listen, I never, I never want you to do drugs for me. Don't do drugs for me. And Richard goes, oh, trust me, I don't do drugs for you. I do them for me. <laughs> and so, you know, Richard is, very, is a very likable, nice guy, right? And I said, um, also, I said, I will never buy you drugs. I will never give you any drugs at all. Mm-hmm. And I would never be a source of that for you. And they're like, yeah, that's cool, you know. You know, and so um, you know we, we established those ground rules. Um, uh, so we ran. You know, coming up to it, I you know I I told them I said you know the Thursday before I said this is going to run this Sunday, and it's going to run on the cover of the Sunday paper, and you know you're probably going to hear from people about it. Um, and Richard's like, oh, I should get rid of these clothes so the police don't recognize me. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do is that's fine, Richard. But it's going to run this weekend. And now she's like, you're going to you're going to run it with our names. And I said, yeah, you know, you remember I, we talked about this. And she's like, okay. <laughs> and so you know, it ran, wow. and uh, the police arrested Richard the next day. Oh no! <laughs> Richard was found. Um, he was out in an alley going through a bag of jewelry, which he says he found in a vacant apartment, in a vacant house. Wow. Um, so he got arrested. And Richard knew he was going to get arrested. When we were first talking to Richard, Richard said, yeah. I said, he said, yeah, you know, I've got outstanding warrants anyways. I'm going back to jail anyways. I don't care. He goes, I get clean when I'm in jail, so it's fine. 
like being in jail does not phase Richard. Um, Richard spent five years in federal prison for drug trafficking. Um, you know, R- Richard sounds like an like. I don't want to portray him to be an idiot because he's not an idiot. He's a fairly. I don't know if he's book smart, but he's he's a he's a likable, nice guy. It's just Richard has a different value system than what we than what you and I have. Mm-hmm. And you know, the threat of going to jail doesn't bother Richard. Where it scares the crap out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Ashley uh, did not get arrested, uh, but we did a follow up story the next week, and we walk on some weird journalism ethics here too. So Ashley. Uh, um, we didn't talk. We didn't talk there for a week or so, and I couldn't get a hold of Richard because you know Richard had been picked up and arrested, and Ashley wasn't returning my phone calls. And I went back down there uh, with some newspapers to give to some of the other people uh, we'd worked with, and Ashley was there. And I'm like, "Oh, hey, Ashley, how are you?" And I said, "You know, they told me Richard had been arrested." And uh, during this, in that week in between there, we did a follow up story on uh, pregnant women. Uh, who needed help with heroin, like like what were the organizations that could help them? Because there was a lot of outcry in the community uh, from these pictures. And um, while we were working on that story, they told Jesse Bogan, our reporter, that, hey, if you have any contact with that woman, Ashley, we've got a bed for her here if she wants it. Mm. And so um, Jesse had passed that information along to me, and I saw Ashley, and I said, hey, uh, you know, just FYI, these guys say they have an open bed for you if you need it. And Ashley's like, no, this is not a big deal at all. This is my third methadone baby. I got this under control. And I'm like, okay, mm. well, you know, just as long as you're aware, there are options out there. Mm-hmm. And um, she actually called me back 45 minutes later. And she's like, uh, I want I want to go to this place. I'm like, oh, that that's great. I said, uh I'll call them and let them know that you're, that you're coming up there. And, and this is weird because ethically, as a journalist, you never want to interfere with the storyline mm-hmm. of, of your subjects. Um, but really, you know, in, in, in reality, I think that I changed – I changed their storyline by publishing 200,000 copies of them shooting up heroin on the front mm-hmm. page of the paper. Right. So th- that, that changes the narrative right there and stuff, mm-hmm. you know. We, um, well, there's a scientific so, principle that by just by looking at something, you change it, the properties right. of it, you know what I mean? So that kind of plays into it. Right. So, you know, so I've changed it, but then it even gets even more weird from an ethical standpoint because then she goes – the guy, she was not. She was while Richard was her boyfriend. She was living with this other guy um, at the time. And, uh, a heroin addict's relationships are messy, and Ashley's relationships are just very messy. There's the the father. The father of the child she was carrying was probably not the guy she was living with either. It was probably this other guy, but maybe Richard. But if it was the guy she was living with, the baby will be Hispanic, so she'll know very very shortly. But like I said, the, her relationships are messy. Um, you know. They're just they're hard to track and stuff. But she says, so Richard's been arrested, and this, she doesn't have contact with this other guy. But the guy she's living with is not going to give her a ride to the to the treatment center. She she says to me, she goes, I need you to give me a ride there, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> like I can't I can't do that. I'm thinking to myself, I can't do that. I can't can't get involved in the story that much. I'm said, wait a second, let me call my boss. And so I called my boss and I explained the situation to him and what we decided was is that ethically if we were going to if we we're going to make an ethical error we we're going to err on the ethical side of bringing the heroin addict to the treatment center to get treatment um where we didn't want to end up is on the ethical ground of having denied the heroin addict a ride to the to the treatment center and then having her overdose next week mm. because you know, then I can be like, oh, I stood on my moral high ground and, you know, I didn't take her to the treatment center and yeah, she died and that's too bad, but I didn't interfere with the story. I, I'm more comfortable being within the, with the thing where I'm admitting to you that yes, I drove her to a treatment center. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, 
you know, I, I did that, and um, that is unusual for me to interfere in a story like that, but um, that that's what I did. Um, well, that was a special case, too. I mean, that's yeah. not something you encounter all the time. So. Right, right. And I'm comfortable, I'm comfortable with what our decisions were. It's also interesting, when Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, came to town, he specifically mentioned Ashley by name in his speech talking about heroin addiction hmm. in St. Louis. And so, you know... That that was interesting um, in itself. Um, I've not I've not had seen Ashley face to face since I dropped her off at the treatment center. She's called me a few times. I actually just spoke with her on on the phone on Monday two days a uh, day ago. Um, she's due to give birth here on Friday. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I may run into her here this week. It's maybe I'm, I'm not sure. I'd like to photograph her before she gives birth again, but mm-hmm. that may not work out either. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm I'm interested in where Ashley's story goes long term. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've also photographed Richard. Richard's had one court hearing already, and he's got another court hearing scheduled here in a couple weeks. And so we photographed Richard uh, at his court hearing, and Richard was happy to see us. You know, we asked him about the stories, and he's happy the stories ran. You know, Richard wants to be an example to other people why you don't do hair. Heroin. So, mm-hmm. so he's getting his wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, now, another thing that that I uh, really appreciate you, about you on, especially on Twitter, is when, um, of course, there's these hapless uh, social media uh, lowly uh, interns that uh, whose job it is to scour uh, for uh, you know photos that they can convince people to uh, give them for free. Uh, of mm-hmm. course, in, instead of actually paying somebody to to either make these pictures or, or paint a freelancer or, or licensing them. Um, talk a little bit about that and, and kind of some of the interactions you've had uh, surrounding people just kind of approaching you uh, in that manner. <laughs> sure. So, you know, over, over the years, you know, I, I've been asked for free photos or to do work for free, and I always sort of bristle at this idea that I'm... <laughs> Excuse me, that my work, you know, that I shouldn't be paid for my work. Um, the one that really got a lot of attraction, uh, a lot of attraction on social media was uh, I was at a high school football game and someone drove by this high school football game firing shots um, at this high school football game. In fact, the shots were so close you could you could smell the gun smoke in the air. And I had made this picture of this mother falling down on the ground and pulling her kids in closer to her and calling, calling to her. And there was these cheerleaders falling down the back background with a scoreboard in the background and I kind of put this picture out on social media and I got this uh, tweet from uh, CBS uh, news and saying hey can we have this picture for credit across all platforms in perpetuity and I like I was like what are you kidding me my newspaper's on the verge of bankruptcy I mean, we can't afford new equipment and you're work for a multi-billion dollar agency and you want to just take my picture for credit you know it was like no and and so I, I, I very, very bluntly smacked him down. I said, you know, I said you're getting paid to do this. Why? How do you know? How dare you ask for my stuff for free? And mm-hmm. um, it was a series of tweets where I where I whacked this poor, you know, this low level uh, CBS employee, you know, who's doing his job, going out and seeking pictures, and I, mm-hmm. I whack him pretty publicly. Um, and then the website Petapixel picked up on the series of tweets and then it really exploded because they did a whole story about Mm -hmm. you know what happens when you ask a Pulitzer Prize winner for free pictures and and I think it really resonated with a lot of creative people because we're asked for stuff to do stuff on credit all the time Mm -hmm. or I'll pay you next time and you know the work I do has value and I want people to you know if you give someone something for free then they don't value it Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you know a lot of times you know we've we have had a few other shots where some people asking for free shots. We rented a helicopter for $500 an hour a couple of weeks ago to go up and make these pictures of all this flooding in St. Louis. And people are like, oh, can I, can I have this photo? And I'm like, no. It's like we, the newspaper paid more than $1,000 just in helicopter fees and the insurance on me and my time and my equipment. I'm like, no, you can't just have this photo. And they, they're very confused why they can't just have the photo because it doesn't, in their mind, it doesn't cost me anything to just give them the photo. But what they fail to see is the investment in time and, you know, just resources of paying for a helicopter to go up and make that shot. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I I will sometimes bite people that ask me for free photos. I try not to be 
too big a jerk about it, but um, I think a lot of people kind of like it when I am jerkish. About it. Well, I, I think I think the the satisfying thing, for, at least from from my perspective, is that you know the, we usually when you're a journalist and you're asked to do something for free, the the come back to you being like, hey, what about you paying me? Is always hey, be great exposure, you know, get your name right. out there. You know, somebody that's already won a Pulitzer Prize doesn't exactly need your exposure, whatever that means. Right. Uh, so so you have a little bit more license to uh, to say no in a way that you know other people might not be able to so. maybe but you know i mean the idea of getting exposure like i i can't eat exposure for dinner yeah, you know? exactly. like, i'm not gonna put a plate full of exposure down for my family to eat you know, yeah like, when i go to the car dealership you know and i'm like hey you know listen um i'm gonna be driving your car and that'd be some great exposure for you you know the car dealer's gonna be like get the hell out of here you know it's like so you know this idea of you know exposure is something like I get that there's some minimal value to mm-hmm. that, but it, you know, what it does is it undercuts my, you know, our, our profession and, mm-hmm. and the value of our profession and what we bring and stuff. So, yeah, you know, I'm always I'm a big proponent of people being paid for their skills. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my, yeah, my car doesn't run on hopes and dreams or whatever. So, <laughs> right, <laughs> um, right. Uh, you're also a weather spotter. Um, kind of, what does that entail, and how did you become one? Yeah, the Southern National Weather Service in town has, uh, we, you know, a, a weather. Uh, they, they train the the weather spotters, and so I went to a couple. I went to a class, and like all of a sudden, dink, you're you're a National Weather Service <laughs> spotter, and I just I just thought with all the with all the weather I covered, that it was worth going going around to to that there. Mm-hmm. Stuff, so yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Um, now, what would your advice be for uh, aspiring photographers? Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways you can be a photographer, but what what would your general advice be? So my advice would be work hard, listen, um, you know, take some internships. See if you can find internships. There's not a lot of internships left, but take some internships and go and and, and just shoot every day. Um, you know, I, I think for me, journalism is a practice in repetition, and the more I do it, the better I am at it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think with a lot of young people, you just have to be exposed to a lot of different scenarios to gain that experience. And so, you know, the next time you're dealing with that situation, you know what's going on. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, now, final question. Uh, I always ask this every episode, but what uh, music have you been listening to lately? What music? So, I have an 11-year-old daughter, Ava, <laughs> and she's totally polluted my music listening. Um, and we constantly have a fight over the radio knob, so like, mm-hmm. Taylor Swift is a favorite of hers. Mm-hmm. Um, um if I have a choice, I, what I've been listening to a lot is I've been listening to the Hamilton soundtrack a lot. So I, I, I went and I saw Hamilton in Chicago. Oh, awesome. I've been listening to that a lot. And uh, it's actually quite funny. My daughter, um, we didn't take my daughter to the show because we didn't think it was appropriate for her to you know, hear all the music. She now has more of the songs memorized than I do. In fact, we do a duet on the – we will sing a duet together on the, on the uh, Aaron Burr Sir song um, where, where I play the role of Alex. Alexander Hamilton and show player Aaron Burr or vice versa. So it's, uh, it's very funny. Um, she goes to um, she goes to a Catholic school here in St. Louis, and uh, we were going off to actually do a choir competition with several of her other friends. And they, uh, the funny thing was, is that they all knew the songs. They all knew the, the songs word for word. And what was funny was, is to hear these you know fifth and sixth grade Catholic kids. It would come to the swears or at some point where they were talking about sex, and the Catholic kids would just go silent, right? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, so you guys know they're bad words. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, right now uh, my car is Taylor Swift and Hamilton. Yeah, um, yeah. One of those I'm embarrassed about. <laughs> <laughs> There's no shame in, in Taylor Swift. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a low-key fan. It's one of those things where like, I only listen to the radio radio when I'm in the car with my three-year-old, uh, almost three-year-old, and uh, you know I don't want to listen to certain things. So I've kind of gotten... Uh, I, I like certain songs that I wouldn't have normally listened to just simply for the fact that I have to listen to them because he's in the right. car. So, right. um, and, and it's weird to, like, I really think if I listen to music, I like, I think I'm a better photographer at the time. So 
like mm-hmm. it, I feel like you know if I feel like I'm in a rut, if I find can find some good music to listen to for some reason, I it triggers other things in my head and I mm-hmm. see things differently. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you wanted to get in before we go here? No, I think we've covered everything. I got to run off here and pick my daughter up at school. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, and uh, yeah, thank you again. Thanks. I uh, appreciate the talk. Cool. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at www.patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review the podcast everywhere it's available, which includes iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. It really helps. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. Until next time.